A. Alvarez said of climbing, it's a small scale model for living, but with a difference. Unlike your routine life where mistakes can usually be recouped and some kind of compromise patched up, your actions for however brief a period are deadly serious. Hi everybody, in today's video, we're going to be discussing Into Thin Air by John Krakauer. Now, I wanted this to be a little bit more than just a review of is this book good or bad, but also kind of a dialogue to those of you who have already read this book or who are generally interested in Everest. Uh, a dialogue looking into the ethics, morality, um, and some of just some themes that I pulled out of the book. I really find looking at stories like this where disasters happen in extreme situations, environments, because I do think we can learn and question what is right, what is wrong, how should we act um, when we're not exactly in control or where the normal rules do not apply. I will also be looking at some notes because I do have a lot of thoughts and I want to make sure that I don't miss out on anything important. I actually have more notes. I'm gonna get my other notes. To begin, I want to discuss a little bit why I'm personally interested in Krakauer's story, what drew me to this book, and it really begins with an, uh, a documentary that I saw about, it was the 1996 climbing year, but it was a few weeks later, and it was about Bruce Harrod's passing on the mountain, and it explored some of like the dynamics between the South African team and the mountain, um, and how his body was left there and how people climbed past his body and that introduction into Everest taught me that it was a harsh place people leave each other behind they're more determined to keep climbing than to save their partners so to me um, some of the events I think in into uh, thin air were maybe a little bit downplayed because I had seen uh, quite a lot of documentaries actually talking about how you know, Everest is just one of those places. It's the Rainbow Valley with all of these corpses and with their jackets. So yeah, like um, with Swing Paljor, I believe that's who they believe that Green Boots is. He's a prominent, um, prominent person on the mountain who had died, and his body and his Green Boots in particular was used as a, um, like a landmark when you're climbing. Like, oh, you passed Green Boots Cave which, you know, that sounds horrifying, especially in how many of us conceive and understand death. It's supposed to be this personal thing with, you know, your family and everything. So to die in a place where not only are you discarded and left because it's hard to get your body back down, but also then your body becomes this landmark that others use. I, I can understand that, that for a lot of people, that's incredibly disturbing, but, back to kind of where I was coming from. Um, yeah, I've had an interest and a fascination in the Everest story for a while. So when I learned of Into Thin Air's existence, I knew I would read this book eventually. So starting off, this book was written by John Krakauer, who is a journalist and kind of, I, I would say he's sort of like an amateur mountaineer. He's someone who had a lot of climbing experience, but wasn't exactly a like professional climber. He's not leading anyone. He's just done this a lot and has written about it and sort of knows what he's doing, but is no expert, um, if you will. And he does know some of these names in the climbing community. He was commissioned to go on the mountain um, by Outside Magazine and to sort of explore some of these paid for guiding teams or guided trips up, which had sort of exploded in popularity and received a lot of criticism from the climbing community who viewed this as sort of a like consumerist capitalist exploitation of like their love of climbing. There's also clearly this defined kind of snow stepping at even Everest as a mountain. Like it's not a very beautiful mountain. So like real climbers don't care about it or it's so commercialized or, you know, oh, it's actually pretty easy once you get up there, you, as long as you have oxygen. If you have oxygen, you're not even really climbing Mount Everest. You're not really doing anything that impressive. So there were all these conversations and um, Sir Edmund Hillary, the man who first climbed up, he has been, he was very critical of this. And I should say, um, 
uh, Sir Edmund Hillary climbed up with Tenzin Norgay, who was the Sherpa who was accompanying him. Very important to point out. Um, so Krakauer was coming up, and in the beginning of the book, I feel like you're really clearly seeing Krakauer's um, explanation. He almost comes across as one of these mountaineers who is a little bit uh, kind of like, ugh. Everest and all these people who are climbing Everest, they're all just wealthy and they're kind of paying to play on the mountain. They don't love mountain, they're not dedicating their life to this. They're all just kind of rich, spoiled people who have the like liquid funds to do this. And in that, I think um, Krakauer does spend part of the beginning of the book sort of juxtaposing these people with himself. So he really presents himself as this man who loves mountains, like, oh, I've been doing this for so long. I gave this up to have a stable job and a career. I am like lower, uh, lower middle class versus these people are so wealthy. These, the, and, and he's, I think he's doing that. Um, in the beginning, I was kind of annoyed with that. Uh, because it's just like, well, yeah, obviously you're saying all this about yourself. You have a vested interest in appearing unlike these other climbers because you're in a way critiquing these climbers and critiquing the industry that is serving these climbers. So I don't know how much I believe you at the end of the day. Yeah, maybe it's this magazine paying you to come up this mountain, but I should mention that outside magazine actually paid for him to climb up, but like you're still up there you're still benefiting because someone wanted to pay you a bunch of money to get you on this mountain. I mean, that's something, right? I don't know. I just found it like a little bit to me in the beginning, he's just sort of like pish posh. They're so stuck up and I'm like really, I'm really into this, but I get why he's doing it, right? I mean, I also get that that is a perspective that is in the mountaineering community. So if he belongs kind of tangentially to that community, he's going to share those opinions. So as I mentioned, uh, Everest is not exactly considered a technically challenging climb. Really, it sits in between Tibet and Nepal. And at some point you're climbing and you are like, you're gonna fall down one side, you're gonna fall into Nepal. And if you fall down the other side, you're gonna fall into China. So once you kind of get acclimatized, if you have all the right gear, if the weather is good, if you can just get up, you can get up. It's not a lot of really intense, crazy, like rock face climbing from what I understand. Um, so that's one of the reasons why these expeditions are able to take place. If you're pretty fit, if you have acclimatized, you can do it realistically like if that mountain peak was like like several thousand feet shorter like it would not be difficult most people could climb it right um why everest is so hard to climb is because it sits in one of the like categories of mountains that are over eight thousand meters high um it is around eight thousand eight hundred fifty meters high or twenty nine thousand feet mountains above this height are kind of they're, they are where the oxygen is so thin that there are a lot of complications and a lot of challenges you have to overcome, including some immense acclimatizing and um, just risk of like your body stops digesting food at that height. Your like your whole your I think like your brain is expanding. It's really easy to get uh, high altitude pulmonary um, not embolism edema, high altitude pulmonary edema or high altitude cerebral edema. So one of those is like your, like your lungs filling up with fluid and the other one is your brain filling up with fluid. Both bad, both can be fatal. And in fact, we do see a death due to HAPE or PAPE, I'm guessing, um, on the mountain, one of the Sherpas succumbs to it. Um, uh, and we also hear, I, I believe like one of the doctors got uh, Hace or H-A-C-E, uh, but he was able to get down because he was sort of recognized or people around him recognized that there was something wrong. Um, but unfortunately, both of these things, the uh, symptoms can kind of come along. You, you don't know that they're happening and then they come along really quickly. 
in the beginning of the book, sort of the first part, I will say it's not like gossipy, but he kind of is giving you kind of the, the sense of what's on the mountain. There is a little bit of, not necessarily rivalry, but you're noticing things. There's a South African team and there's a bunch of like ill will spread between them. There is a sense of, you know, the Rob Hall, who is kind of a established face on the mountain. And you have Scott Fisher, um, who is another, both of these are guides. Scott Fisher, he's kind of well known in the community, but he is... Uh, new to this mountain and really trying to you know prove his worth and you're meeting some of the uh, meeting some of the characters who are going to become involved such as you know uh, Doug Hansen who had been climbing previously and Rob Hall actually invited him back because Doug Hansen wasn't able to summit and Rob Hall really wanted him to be able to have that opportunity so he like gave him a discount rate said please come back I really want to get you up there uh, you're also seeing characters like Sandy Hill Pittman, who was sort of a New York socialite and had a lot of money and was really advertising her story. She had a lot of gear. She's also sort of described as one of these people who, you know, she's up here, but is she really up here kind of for the right reasons or is this PR for her in a way? And she does kind of, there is sort of a, sent a sentiment of perhaps a little bit of ill will because she was one of these celebrity clients and then getting more attention um, and more care than maybe some of the others. Along with that, of course, we are introduced to Beck Weathers. I will just bring it up now. If you don't know anything about the 1996 incident, one of the things you probably will learn about if you look into it even a little bit is the story of Beck Weathers. Beck Weathers, this is also important because I feel like this part is not discussed a lot. Beck Weathers, a wealthy physician from Texas, uh, goes up on this mountain. At some point he becomes blinded. Um, he had had surgery previously. He can no longer see as the higher up he gets and he sits down for a while because he's told by Rob Hall, wait for me here. He waits for a long time. Eventually he's like, you know what? I probably should be going. I've been up here doing nothing for a long time. He starts coming down, climbing down, but the storm has already hit, is, is hitting. I'll get into that. I'll get to that in a more point. He eventually uh, sort of is just so exhausted. He passes out and however long later, wakes up, regains consciousness, and stumbles back into the camps by himself, frost, like suffering from frostbite in like blizzard, pitch black weather, he manages to find his way back into this camp. And then the next day, he's almost left for dead a second time where someone doesn't realize that's a person. They think it's like a, a bundle of sleeping bags. So he's almost left for out a second time. He amazingly, miraculously survives and he is left with pretty severe frostbite. They have to take, I believe, one of his hands and part of one of his arms. I'm assuming his feet and, and or like just toes are gone. Part of his face, his nose is gone. He really went through just a terrible experience. But he survives and that is one of the reasons i think why the story catches on is that you know as i've seen sort of said in document uh documentaries uh beck weathers redefines what is considered survivable what is considered recoverable from because everyone thought that this man was surely gone he was passed out he could not walk for him to then be able to regain consciousness and get himself anywhere is like a miracle so that is one of the very big events and Beck Weathers is obviously someone that Cracker wants to talk about because he wants to give you an idea of who this person is and who this person is from Cracker's perspective is very wealthy, clearly Republican, and um, not someone with a ton of experience. Like he's climbed mountains before but he does not know what he's doing. He's, you know, not that he's like not in it for the right reasons like the whole bachelor or bachelorette tagline I think but in a way, you know, this is someone who's kind of just getting to have a wild couple months on Everest and not a true, experienced, dedicated man climbing mountains. So yeah, you do kind of get these introductions into, into these people. Now, I will come back later to um, kind of put a ribbon on some of these questions that I've brought up now, but I want to get into what I noticed as one of the major themes that comes up uh, in the book, and that is reliance. Um, I think when you're climbing mountains like this from the perspective of, I've read a book about it, right? Like I don't, I don't know, but there's a lot of who you have to rely on and what you need to be able to do this. Yes, the mountain itself 
not particularly technically challenging but to make it so that a lot of people can go up the mountain you have to have a number of things in place first of all you have to have guides people who are willing to take inexperienced climbers up now if you're gonna have guides you absolutely need to have sherpas sherpas is an ethnic group and also a job um like a capital s distinguishes between them and john oliver talked about that and i was like i probably should bring it up here too um so you need sherpas because they are doing most of the work they are carrying all of this equipment and gear a lot of times they're the ones going up and putting out ropes and ladders so that people can climb through everything they are um indispensable to the team and you need therefore need to rely on your sherpas sherpas need to rely on others um and there do become conflicts of interest as krakow describes sherpas know that if they manage to summit they have a higher likelihood of being hired again the next climbing season and being hired on in positions that actually native positions that actually allow them to summit which are then higher paid positions so you'll see people sometimes maybe pushing themselves a little bit farther than they should because they want to be um, put in a good situation for the next climbing season. <laughs> okay. Next up after Sherpas, I think we should talk about oxygen and bottled oxygen. This is indispensable to the average Everest climber because if you are oxygen deprived, you can't do anything. But like you also very much cannot like maintain enough awareness to climb a mountain. Um, kind of being delusional or being a little bit loopy or drunk is uh, a very big symptom and something that a number of people succumb to on the mountain. So bottled oxygen is a big thing, but it's also kind of in a way controversial because on a lot of mountaineers think if you have to use bottled oxygen, like it's not really you summiting, it's almost like you're kind of doping in a way. Uh, and so the cracker even suggests towards the end of the book that perhaps the limit limited use of bottled oxygen would keep people safer because if you don't have that oxygen um, less people can go high less people will be inclined to even attempt to climb this mountain so it could t technically re reduce mortality it's also important to point out that the use of bottled oxygen results in a lot of waste there's tons of these discarded discarded cans there's a bunch of litter and um, refuse on this mountain and there are um, efforts to clean it but it's sort of the point is if we weren't going up there people wouldn't you know be putting garbage there we wouldn't even need to clean up the garbage so point to make the use of oxygen while climbers need to rely on it there are some pitfalls and absolute downsides uh, in terms of this case very relevant you need to be able to rely on weather uh, if you're if it's not clear weather then you obviously are not going to be able to go up uh, but also if you have a big season of climbing and there's a bunch of bad weather it can reduce a very um reduce the amount of days that people can climb therefore causing more people to climb on the same day and causing delays and you do not want to be delayed in a place where you know the oxygen that you have is limited and you need that to survive also it gets harder to do anything the more you wait around because your body gets cold it is just better to be up and down but when there's more climbers when there's bad weather all that is harder also you have to rely on your own body your own health as i mentioned with back weathers the reason he was going blind was because he had surgery on his eyes years earlier and didn't realize that like because who would realize that oh like that being in high altitude would affect his vision so you kind of have to hope that your body is just sort of good enough to get you up there uh and that you know if that fails you at twenty-eight thousand feet <laughs> what are you gonna do also you have to rely on other teams so one of the things that ended up happening on this particular trip rob hall had a specific day he wanted to go up um and so does scott fisher again these were two of the guides but because there was sort of was some i think miscommunication they were going up at the same time as the taiwanese team and uh the south african team the south, south african team were absolute monsters and we're just like we're gonna go up whenever we want to go up but it kind of seems that there may have just been some miscommunication with the Taiwanese team so all of a sudden you have all these people trying to get up and that caused like I said delays especially when people are not experienced and don't know how to use some of the tools because um, they're not real mountain climbers 
So one thing I found really fascinating is on Everest, unlike other mountaineering things, you don't actually like hook yourself to other people. I know that's something that people will do where they're like using each other to balance out their weight or something. Uh, you don't do that on Everest, which I kind of can understand because these are not consistent teams, right? You might be a crack hour or you might be a Beck Weathers. So you don't want to have people like two people who aren't very good at climbing and climbing together. And you don't want to have a person who's really good at climbing, climbing with someone who's going to hold them back and put their themselves at risk. You also cannot trust your own senses. This is something that ends up being huge in the book. So your brain is not functioning properly at this height. You're probably running out of oxygen. I feel like every single story of someone going up Everest, they're they're running out of oxygen before they're even halfway down the mountain. Um, and so one of the really big events uh, is Andy Harris. Andy Harris is a guide on Rob Hall's team. And Krakauer, throughout the, his, uh, his portion where he's talking about summiting coming down, he talks about uh, meeting and running into Andy Harris and saying, well, I saw Andy Harris do this. I saw Andy Harris do that. He, he was acting a little weird. He kept saying there was an oxygen in these certain bottles, even though we knew there was some oxygen. Um, and he's like, in that moment, I didn't understand that this pro person was probably suffering oxygen deprivation. Um, and so he describes what he thinks happens to Andy. He thinks he sees him walk into the camp. And so he's going, he's going down and he's like, oh yeah, Andy has to be here. Later they realize Andy Harris is missing. And he's like, if he's missing, he must have just walked off the cliff. He doesn't know where he, he must've just walked off. So he thinks this guy is over in this one area because of this interaction that he had, because he knows he was talking to him. Months later, after all this has occurred and Andy Harris's body has not been found, he's talking to a guy and the guys are saying, oh yeah, I like said hi to this one guy on the mountain and then I fall down and I was kind of acting like, like I was so worried and, and this thing happened. And Krakauer is amazed because he's like, wait a minute, that's exactly what I saw happen to Andy Harris. And he realizes that whole time he thought he was talking to this one person he thought he was watching this one man he was watching a completely different person and he had been like with this one man this whole time he'd known this man and he still thought he was a completely different person to where he was essentially resulting in misleading family members about where this man was and what happened to him the day of his death and he like it's very clear that crack hour is like beside himself he's I, honestly i think like in the beginning, he's kind of a prick. Towards the end, you can tell that he's filled with remorse and he's like, he, he, he this isn't a story that makes him look good and he clearly doesn't think highly of himself. He, he's a frustrated with himself. I'm not saying he does, doesn't, he thinks he's like a bad person, but it's really clear that like the fact that he misidentified like Paris sits with him greatly um, and greatly disturbs him. And it disturbed me as really, like, oh my God, you, you, you thought you were talking to one man and you were talking to another man. That's terrifying. Um, so yeah, you can't trust your own senses. And, and you'll hear this sort of happen. Um, Rob Hall, what ends up happening with Rob Hall is he is leading Doug Hansen up. Doug Hansen at some point indicates, hey, maybe I should turn around. But Rob Hall does not want to have Doug Hansen have the same thing happen to him again as in the previous year. So he says, come on, I'll get you up there. They get him up there, but at this point, it is very slow going and they're up there way later than they should be. There are turnaround times on Mount Everest because you need to get down. The goal is not just to get up, it's to get back down. Um, and so uh, Hall is trying to help Hansen up. He ends up getting stuck and he's like, we're out of oxygen and I don't know what to do. Now, Andy Harris, we mentioned earlier, he kept telling people with these radios, there's no oxygen at this one place called the Hillary Step. But that wasn't true. There was oxygen there. And everyone keeps telling, trying to get over it. Harris was saying, there's no oxygen there. Another guy in my room also was ready. He's like, no, there is, there is. Please go down. Please get oxygen. Please leave Doug Hansen. Go get some oxygen. Go back up to him and get him oxygen. Do not just stay there. And it takes a while for them to break through to understand like there's oxygen there. By the time they tell Paul and they're out, actually there is oxygen on the mountain. Unfortunately, he is really suffering the effects of not having had oxygen for a long time. And he's like, oh no, like he's not going down. He's not getting oxygen, even though it's clear he desperately, desperately needs it. And that happens all the time. People get up there. They're so focused on getting up. They kind of just 
lose other will and they're not focusing on keeping themselves safe and you know uh, same thing happened with bruce harrod he's on the mountain it's too late he needs to be turning back down they're like you need to get down you need to get down. And he's kind of like yeah yeah okay yeah yeah he's not getting back down they, they it's and so that's not that you have trusting your senses is something you can't do and it doesn't matter if you're the guy who this is the you're, this is your first time on a mountain or this is your hundredth time on a mountain it can affect anyone and so it's something that you really get a sense of watching this video watching well, not watching the video watching videos watching documentaries but also reading the book but like you know the, the, the guarantee of safety is non-existent in this uh on this mountain Alrighty, next up and this is a bit of a side note kind of a little palette cleanser before we get into some of the more serious more deep stuff and that is um some aspects of intercultural communication on this mountain so as i mentioned earlier there was a taiwanese team but you also had um like you know you know, people from, from all over the world uh climbing together and i do believe there and also climbing with the sherpa um the sherpas again both an ethnic community and um like a job description so there is a, a a need to know how to interact with people from a different background to your own uh, also of course respecting um that this is a really important sort of buddhist landmark for some of these people and so there's like certain ways you have to walk around um like there are these pillars and you have to walk around them a certain way you have to respect there's prayer flags everywhere um, and go see some religious leaders but along with that too uh there was kind of some stuff that happens where it almost seems like crack hour is judging the morality of some groups and because of the nature that these groups are often joined via their country um it almost seems like he's judging like japanese people as opposed to the japanese team and unfortunately these people don't get to like really explain their side so you don't get like why did that happen for example the taiwanese team one of their climbers dies and cracker kind of describes it as they just kept going um and then during all of the, the events that are occurring on may 10th may 10th is like the big day where all the storm happened um during that time i think on the other side on the uh tibetan side because these people come climbing from nepal the tibetan side uh there was a um, and I believe an Indian team and there were these Ladakhi climbers and three of them perish and the Japanese, a Japanese team is said to have walked past them and sort of not helped. Um, and again, no explanation was given as to why this happens. No, from my perspective, kind of reach out of why did you do that? What was your view on this? Um, and I do believe that you know, there could have been some very reasonable explanations such as we were told that on the mountain you will encounter people dying and you have to protect yourself that's something that i've heard about this mountain and i've never tried climbing it also i feel like sometimes he describes like certain members of Sherpa community and it's like maybe a little patronizing i think it's hard to tell without knowing someone and knowing how they're talking and maybe i'm getting that sense because of a bias that I have and if I was there I would understand the situation very differently but I don't know like there's some element of like describing the Sherpa community as superstitious um and again I don't know which specific he means the ethnicity or just people who are Sherpas on the mountain are very superstitious and in a way it almost comes across as like oh they're so superstitious they have these beliefs about the mountain but at the end of the day those are those people's like deeply held religious beliefs and we would honor that as we should you know honor people's religious views like that's just we should have space for that and we should have space for that on this mountain where a bunch of western people who probably actually don't respect people's you know people of different backgrounds are coming to trash just so they have bragging rights like let's just let's just say that I also want to talk about Anatoly Burkiv. He was a Russian guide on Scott Fisher's team who was climbing and a lot of people have some pretty negative views on 
how Burkid acted on the mountain, especially because even though he was a guide, he wasn't using supplemental oxygen, which meant that he was not able to really spend a lot of time helping and assisting other people. Um, and this actually ends, one of the things I find crazy with this book, so this book, there was an article written and there's this book written. Then there is an epilogue, an author's note, and a postscript. Krakauer kept having stuff to say, but the postscript primarily deals with um, Burkif's book, who was written with the help of a um, American writer named G. Weston DeWalt. And apparently Burkif, Burkif actually did pass away in 1997 in an avalanche, but the, um, but the DeWalt book is apparently kind of riddled with a lot of inaccuracies, a lot of things that Krakauer are saying, hey, look, I interviewed people, I said the best of my recollection, the best of my ability. And I feel like Krakauer does a good job of saying like, I remembered things, but I was very wrong. He doesn't present himself as like the sole source of information on the mountain. But um, what Keith becomes an interesting character on the mountain because there were things you could say that were like, that was not a smart thing to do, but you can also cross with, okay, well, what, what role do you think a guide has and what role does perhaps being um, Russian, I think he's like ethnically Russian from Kazakhstan, like what role does you know your culture play into how you think you're supposed to act when you're a paid guide? Maybe you think your job is to just like walk up and down and sort of lead, like just be in front of these people. You know, how was that established? What was going on? It's hard to know and I will say too, um, I think Krakauer does a good job of both being critical of Burkif but also being like um, willing to take time to say the stuff he does right. He talks in his book about how after Burkif gets down, he spends a lot of time actually going and looking and finding people who are lost in the storm and he is sick, he's vomiting. People see him and they see that he's ill and he keeps trying to help people. So yeah, he did bad but he was one of the people who was able to rescue others. So what, what can you say there? So yeah, I don't know. I just thought it was interesting, this element of like talking about these people, but these people not being like Krakauer. And I kind of kept expecting some conversation about that. And the only conversation does come in the postscript where an Italian friend of Burkiv's is like telling Krakauer, like, look, you're an American, he's a Russian, you're just different. I was like, fair enough. Also fair enough, if you're guiding people wear a goddamn oxygen mask, I think that's fair. <laughs> I think that's reasonable. This is actually where I stopped writing notes on this. So I'm going to switch over to my written notes and get into ethics in the death zone. Now, I keep talking about the storm. What was going on with the storm? Basically, our teams, Rob Hall's team, which I think was called like, it was like Adventures or something. I've like, I remember Mountain Madness because it's so good to remember. Adventure Consultants Guided Expedition. I'm sorry, you know, Mr. Hall, you seem like you were a really great man, but Mountain Madness is so much easier to remember. So there was the Mountain Madness team, the Great Adventure Consultants Guided Expedition. Then there was the Taiwanese Expedition and the Johannesburg Sunday Times Expedition. They were filled with gossip. I feel like no one else on this mountain like these people. Um, and I think those were the four teams summiting on May 10th. Now, as they're summiting, they're all coming up, some people are slowly trickling down, a storm comes up and it was very unexpected. And it comes up later in the day, which poses some issues because people are already up this mountain and coming down and they're coming down to this storm, they're already exhausted, they're already running out of oxygen. And when they're coming down, they're also then unable to find the camps. Now, if you don't find the camp, you can very easily walk off this mountain and fall thousands of feet. So um, it's a big deal that, they, uh, that they're lost and that there is this very big storm. But some of my question when it comes to morality on this mountain or ethics, whichever word is more appropriate is, is it okay to leave people if you think they're dying? We hear Beck Weather's story how do you know when someone's dying? What if they're still in a place where they could survive and you've just left someone for dead who is recoverable? On the other hand, there's a great danger 
that if you try stopping and helping someone, you too will die. All of these people are exhausted. I would like to stress that out. As we see, Burkiv, even though he was not with Oxford, he was actually one of the more, absolutely one of the more experienced people on that mountain. So he was able to help people even though he had been climbing without oxygen. But, on, but people who did have oxygen were also not able to go out and help. They were so exhausted. Um, by the time they were coming down that when their co comrades need com comrades when their compatriots needed them they weren't able to go out and help um i upon reading everything right would tell you no if you're going to an extreme place where death is present you're aware of it you know what can happen to you you have to listen to the people who are telling you what to do listen to guides use whatever whatever festering bits of common sense exist in your oxygen deprived brain and you cannot expect people to save you they're saving themselves that's my like cold take on this but then i think if you were to ask me abandon someone on a mountain i don't think i could do that i think i would have an incredibly hard time letting go of a human but then again i'm not exhausted on the top of the mountain everyone knows that risk is it your responsibility as someone who's just coming along to save someone else, to be a hero, potentially at your own expense? Is it fair for you to expect that everyone else is gonna come save you when they're busy trying to save themselves? I don't know. And this is why you have to be prepared. You have to have things like turnaround times. You have to have enough oxygen. You have to know what you're doing and know when you cannot do anything else, when you've gone too far, or when you're about to go too far and you need to turn back now. But again, all of this is undercut when you do not have the mental capacity to make right decisions. I think this is why I'm very critical of people who go on this mountain because you could be someone that then needs saving and that someone else risks their life to save you. You could literally take others down with you. And I don't think that's okay. I don't think it's okay to Put yourself in that situation just hoping everything will be fine just because for hundreds of other people it's been fine you know you're causing all of this garbage you're putting other people at risk i just think why would you do that climb other mountains this one's been climbed before <laughs> you it, like someone will have also done it you don't have to do that one F find another thing get get a there's other mountains Okay, guess what the mountains. Quite frankly, one of the problems is a lot of these people actually can't climb other 8,000 meter mountains because the other 8,000 meter mountains are much, much harder to climb. Like K2, that mountain seems crazy. People are dying there all the time. So wrapping up, let's, let's, wrap, let's wrap this up. It's a very long video. What is sort of some of the conclusions? I think some of the conclusions are that you just kind of can't predict what'll go wrong. You started off with this great, beautiful day with very experienced people, and yet the unthinkable happened to them because it was actually pretty predictable. It's actually like as unpredictable as it is, it's pretty predictable something will go wrong on this mountain. How do you stay safe? How do you protect yourself when you're just in a dangerous environment? Um, like I said, I think don't go up. The other big, I don't know, in all of this, one of the documentaries I watched, they talked about Makalu or Makalu Gao. Uh, he is one of the Taiwanese climbers. And he said something that is either profoundly beautiful or so unbelievably foolhearted, <laughs> foolhardy. And I don't know which it is. And he was talking because he also lost his fingers and toes to frostbite. He's talking about climbing he's saying if i had known when i when i was researching climbing this mountain if i had known that i would come back down losing my fingers and my toes i wouldn't have gone but i went up knowing that that was a possibility not knowing for sure it happened but knowing it's a possibility and now that it's happened i'm fine with it i can live that that was the cost and to me there is something almost spiritual in that that when we know what the risks are we are willing to take them. But when we have to pay for something, and when, when that payment is, you know, the risk, when we have actually gone through and came out on the other side, 
the risk becomes worth it. We are now okay with the sacrifices we had to make. And on one hand, that is silly. Why are you now okay with this? You, you, you lost you lost something and you knew you were going, you knew that was a possibility. You were okay with going because you didn't think it really happened to you. You didn't really think, you knew it could, but you wouldn't really do it. Because if you had known for sure, if you 100% knew you were going to lose your fingers, you're like, no, you 100% lost your fingers. So that risk, you should have known, you should have known you were gonna die. If, if you would know for a fact you were gonna die on that mountain, you probably wouldn't go up. Even though you, everyone who climbs knows that's a possibility. They all know what can happen to them. But yet, but yet, those people are, 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 are willing to go and they come back down. And I'm sure they're happier to be down than some people don't come back down. Uh, I don't know. That quote will always, I think it'll stick with me. I, I heard it and I was like, that is actually, I think that that's kind of in a way life changing. But in a way, I'm also like, I'm not going to climb Mount Everest still. You know, that doesn't make me want to do that. I don't have the money. I don't have the, the, the willpower. I don't have the death wish either. So, and all this is to say, by the way, if you know people who have perished in not only this mountain, but others, people who've taken great risks, I don't think that there's a place to judge people for doing that. I think we're all searching something out and some people search for stuff out in those environments. And I really do think that everyone wanted to keep everyone safe. No one wanted other people to die. No one wanted to do something risky and have someone lose their life. Like I think Rob Hall, you know, he didn't go down to get oxygen because he didn't want to abandon his client. A man he had come to know over two climbing seasons. I think he was doing what he thought was the right thing. It's just, how do you do the right thing when you are not in, when you're not in this situation, when you're not up, up to that level because you're in danger yourself. Um, I will link a bunch of documentaries that I really recommend watching. I think it's cool to see uh, Ask a Mortician's video. She talks about the bodies on Everest. I think um, the Nova video that's uh, narrated by Jodie Foster is good to watch. The video that talks about um, Bruce Herod, very good. Um, there's one that features my groom who isn't featured a lot in other documentaries, but he's actually quite, um, he really did help some of the climbers come down. Uh, there's, there's that one. There's one that takes place completely after this involving a woman who had never climbed any mountain before and she was gonna climb an Everest and she ended up summiting. She perished on the way down, but she did end up summiting. So there's a, there's a bunch of stuff, a bunch of cool resources. These are some of the free ones on YouTube, which is why I'm specifically recommending those as opposed to like a Netflix alternative. But yeah, I really enjoyed this book and I, I really do think I'll read some more of Crack Hour. Uh, and I think I actually might enjoy the stuff where he's a little less involved because like I was saying in the beginning, I was kind of annoyed with his like self-description. I was like, well, yeah, of course, you're the amazing, you know, mountaineer. But like I said, towards the end, it doesn't get like that. I think he is actually like, I think he has to just have a, a fair understanding of himself and like the role he did play and the role he didn't play. Like, I don't, I don't think he was a, a monster on this mountain, but he also wasn't a hero. And, and I'm glad that he like kind of admits to as much. Yeah, let me know if you've read this book. Let me know if you enjoyed this book. Let me know what you thought of my kind of commentary, more like in-depth involvement. I feel like videos like this can be kind of a lot. So let me know if you enjoyed it. And I will see you. Oh, I should do what I'm currently reading. That's been, I, I have not been doing that in my most recent videos. I was reading The French Concession, but I think I might sort of pause. It's sort of hard to get really into. So I've gone back and I'm currently finishing up Tomb of Sand. Um, so hopefully I'll have that done soon. And I'm listening to Journey to the Center of the Earth on audiobook. But yeah, and I hope to see you guys soon in another video. Bye-bye.